The scripture reading today is Mark 5, chapters 1, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And then you can find this on page 1529 of the Pew Bibles. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened, and the demon-possessed man and told all about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Good morning, High Point Church. Just, uh, just pray with me here as we start this morning. Father, I ask that you would glorify yourself in these words today from Mark chapter 5. In Christ's name, amen. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Hesse. Uh, our family, we serve in Berlin, Germany, and uh, we are one of High Point's supported missionaries. And it's good to be back with you. We are here uh, for our year-long home assignment, and we're just about to wrap that up. We'll be heading back to Berlin in August. So you may have seen our family around here. Uh, prior to the mission field, our, I was a pastor, lead pastor of the, of the church, uh, free church in uh, Richland Center, Wisconsin. So we're not new to Wisconsin. Uh, we were there for almost 11 years. And so it's good to be with you here this morning and to open God's word together. So a couple, a couple of things. Uh, I come to you this morning with a couple of assumptions. Uh, assumption one is that uh, the mission of God is for everyone and not just church leaders. It's for you. I deeply care about the mission of God going forward here in the States, and I care about your involvement, your part in that. It's not just for church leaders, not for pastors, and certainly not for missionaries alone. The, the second assumption I have this morning is that the situation here, the cultural milieu of the U.S. is becoming more like the place that I live, Berlin. So let me, let me just uh, orient you to our uh, cultural context. Uh, Berlin is one of the most secular, least religious places on the planet. Uh, it's, it's known as the atheist capital of Europe. 
And so you'll see the brutal facts of what we're facing as we work to make disciples and plant churches in Berlin. If we were to see just 10% of Berlin come to Christ, uh, it would mean the following statistics. So roughly about 1% of Berliners, a city of almost 4 million people, follow Jesus. And so the the task is great. Uh, And so we come back to the States for our year-long home assignment, and it's like, oh my goodness, what country have we come back to? (laughs) These last few years have been nuts, haven't they? So here's what I want everybody to do. I want you to just take a deep breath. And let's remember together that God is still on his throne. Psalm 93. He's on his throne. That's comforting. But I come back to the States and uh, you know, talk to a believer who's followed Christ for 30, 35 plus years, and he's like, they're canceling my culture, meaning Christian culture. And so we have this feeling of Christianity being marginalized here, and I want to suggest to you that that's what I feel in Berlin all the time. Now here's the deal. What if these feelings that you feel, that I feel as I've come back to the States, what if that doesn't change? What if whatever this life is now, what if, and I hate this phrase, but what if that's the new normal? And I'm not just talking about the pandemic. I, I'm talking about the, the social upheaval. I'm talking about the, the loss of truth and the politicization of every area of life, including the life of faith. What in the world? I would like to suggest to you that this disorientation that you feel, this disequilibrium, are some of the feelings of an increasingly secular society. Have you guys ever been on a boat and you you can't get your sea legs and that feeling of just like, I I don't know where the horizon is, I can't get my bearing? Here's the thing. The mission of God doesn't stop just because you and I can't get our footing in this culture. So how does the mission of God go forward here in an increasingly secular age here? Well, I, you know, we've spent the last six years in Berlin. I'm hoping that some of the lessons we've learned, some of the things we've failed in, can serve and help you here today. So if you take notes, if you like doing that, uh, here's, here's my big idea for this morning. Here's what I'd love for you to take away. Secular people, and I'll explain what that means in a second, Secular people desperately need to see Christ's superiority over everything, and especially in the supernatural, spiritual realm. As I've learned how to do ministry in one of the most secular societies on the planet, this is the lesson I bring back to you, that showing and displaying and demonstrating Christ's superiority over the supernatural spiritual powers of this world is what makes the mission of God, in some sense, go forward. So a a brief moment about definition of terms. What do I mean by secular? Well, here's, here's what I mean. Secular society is a place where belief in God is one option among many options. I I don't mean this. I don't mean the emptying of God from the public sphere of life. That's not how I define secular. Nor do I I, um, define it as the the lack of religious affiliation. Uh, Charles Taylor described uh, the move to secular in the following way. He said the the shift, and this is really important, pay attention, the, the shift to secularity in this sense consists of a move from a society where belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic 
to one in which it is understood to be one option among others and frequently not the easiest to embrace. That's what we're moving towards here in the States. And it's important to recognize that according to this definition that both those who follow Christ and those who don't follow Christ can exhibit degrees of secular thinking. And we'll talk more about that in a second. See, the reality is is that the U.S. in in this country, Christianity no longer has a privileged role in shaping the life and values of this culture. As a result, people cobble together spiritual experiences from a number of different places because we're spiritual people. So it's not uncommon to come across someone like this fictional person that I'm going to describe for you, someone who maybe wears a cross, keeps a Buddhist statue in their bedroom, consults a spiritist for life decisions, engages in sexual relations with a variety of people, possibly of different genders, attends church on a Sunday morning, claims Jesus as their savior, but believes in reincarnation after death. Like, that's a possibility. And so the solution to the cultural vertigo that you and I feel, listen, the solution is not the restoration of some lost political witness or a resacralization of society. That's not the answer. Rather, the way forward, I think, is a rediscovery, the rediscovery and an application of the power of God expressed through the kingdom of God in everyday life. Secular people desperately need to see Christianity as a lived reality in your life. Not just a set of beliefs. They need to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why this text from Mark 5 is important. So Mark 5 describes this dramatic deliverance of a demonized man in two distinct scenes. It's the coming of the kingdom in power. And it's important for us to think through this in terms of the mission of God moving forward. So some of you might be asking, why this passage about this crazed demoniac? What does this have to do with living in a secular age? Well, in, in the world of the first century, first century, in the life of Jesus, there were multiple belief options to pursue. The world of the New Testament is remarkably pluralistic, actually more similar to the world we have now than dissimilar. So contextually speaking, I think there's much that we can learn from this text and the way that Jesus operates in ministry in this pluralistic environment. I also chose this text this morning because uh, it probably makes us a little bit uncomfortable. At least it makes me slightly uncomfortable. See, I think we're comfortable with this text set firmly in the world of the New Testament and as, as a part of the ministry of Jesus. But the moment we take this text with our modern scientific enlightened mindset and place these events as a potential reality here and now, there's a good chance that we become slightly uncomfortable by that. And it likely, we become uncomfortable because you and I maybe have some deception going on. See, it's it's likely that we bring with us into this gathering today preconceived understandings about texts just like this. We have a worldview And the worldview shapes how we see and read this text. You know what a worldview is, right? I don't need to, I mean, you guys sit under Nick's teaching. That should be evident. I mean, worldviews are unseen filters through which we see things around us. They're a lot like tree stumps. Have you ever tried to pull up a tree stump Pain in the butt. Excuse the crass language. 
See, if there's, if there's something faulty or off kilter in our worldview, it's really hard to uproot that. So my prayer is this morning is that this text from Mark 5 might might help us root out the last vestiges of maybe a deceived, deceptive worldview that keeps us from seeing this text the way that it's intended. So turn with me again in your Bibles to Mark 5 to the first scene in this dramatic encounter. Here's what I would like for you to contemplate as we go through this text together. Our response to this episode, our response to Christ's superiority over the unseen powers, I think reveals the degree of our deception impacting our ability to reach highly secular people. See, for for Christ, all of life is spiritual and not just in a religious sense. Christ lived in a world where crazed men live in tombs and bust through chains, where enormous herds of pigs rush headlong to their death, and all of those events are attributed to this cosmic conflict taking place in the spiritual realm that can't be seen, and that's normal. Christ normalizes the supernatural in everyday life, He comes proclaiming the good news of the kingdom in word and deed and power. In other words, his ministry had implications for the material world and the immaterial world as well. Look at the text. I mean, one of the themes at this point in Mark's gospel is the limitless authority of Christ and his power. As we pick up the story in chapter 5, Jesus and his disciples, they've they've just crossed the, the Sea of Galilee They enter the uh, southeastern area, the region of the Gerasenes, this highly non-Jewish Gentile area. And there Jesus and his entourage steps off the boat and they meet this demonized man living in the tombs. And Mark goes to great lengths to describe the the despicable, the, the horrible, the tragic, the shameful condition of this man. The nakedness, the pigs, the chains, the the ritually unclean tombs, the isolation, the ostracization, the cutting, the blood. All of these things piled together make the point that the situation is about as unclean and shameful as it possibly could be from a Jewish point of view. Nothing could control this guy. He's this presented to us as this pawn in this cosmic spiritual battle. And then he meets Jesus in verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you, by God, do not torment me. This man filled with the maximum number of demonic concentrations. Legion, this man knows who's boss. It's Christ. The son of the Most High God. I don't know if you caught this, but that title, the Son of the Most High God, there's hardly a higher, more authoritative title that the demon-possessed man could have called Jesus than this one. If there's a string of words that you would use to call a man God, this is it. The man possessed begs permission for the demons to be sent into the pigs. And the picture presented to us is that Jesus is in complete control. It's important for us at this point to, to consider how Christ himself saw this episode. Have you ever thought about that? Like, what did Jesus think about what was happening? See, I think Christ saw this episode as the defeat of Satan. In other words, Christ saw his exorcisms 
this display not so much as a cure of some kind of physical illness, or mental illness. But he saw this as the, the resting of control, this man's life, from the dominating grip and influence of Satan. Is that how you see this text? See, as we read this text with Jesus as the hero of the story, which he is, and as we cheer him on from a distance, go, Jesus, get him, Jesus. We recognize Christ's power and authority in the text, as we should. But as our gaze shifts from the ancient world of the New Testament to our world here and now, the possibility of something like this happening now is probably explained away by our understanding of modern medicine, understanding of psychological illness, our desire perhaps for a safe and sanitized Christianity, without even realizing it, we demythologize scripture and we adopt a worldview that is fundamentally different from the worldview of Jesus. And without realizing it, we strip Christ of the power and authority he deserves in the here and now, and that handicaps us in reaching highly secular people. Please listen to me this morning. My point this morning is not to make, to make a case for demonic deliverance, although I'm not against that. My point this morning is that you and I are not spiritual enough. My point is to hold this text up in front of us as a mirror to help us evaluate our worldview. Let me see if I can unpack this a little bit. In 1982, a a missiologist by the name of Paul Hebert wrote an article, a brilliant little article called The The Flaw of the Excluded Middle. Prior to writing this article, Hebert served as a missionary in India. So he's a, a Western American going to serve in India. And in this article, he wrote about his experience in India. And listen, listen to what he wrote. He said this, As a Westerner, I was used to, to presenting Christ on the basis of rational arguments, not by evidences of his power in the lives of people who were sick, possessed, and destitute. In particular, The confrontation with spirits that appeared so natural a part of Christ's ministry belonged, in my mind, to a separate world of the miraculous, far from ordinary, everyday experience. End quote. See, Hebert goes on to say that the reason this happened is because without realizing it, he had adopted a two-tiered modern, supernatural, natural view of reality that more resembled platonic dualism than the biblical worldview and the witness of Scripture, as the slide shows here. He had carved up this world into the material and the spiritual. He believed in the spiritual. The problem was he goes to India, and those two worlds never mixed. He had no way to connect with people in India who saw that the excluded middle of life was completely spiritual. And I want to suggest to you that we do the exact same thing. You and I live with an excluded middle where the spiritual doesn't crash into the material. We believe in the spiritual, but it makes no difference whatsoever in everyday life. And that is what keeps us from connecting and powerfully ministering to highly secular people. You see, the end result of this kind of worldview, this 
parceled up worldview is, as Leslie Newbegin pointed out, that Western Christianity has been one of the greatest secularizing forces in history. Without realizing it, you and I have contributed to the secularization process that we bemoan. See, the reality is this world is intensely spiritual. And things like the demonic are real. Colossians 1.16. Colossians 2.15. This world can't be neatly carved up into the material and the immaterial, the supernatural, the natural, with those two realms never mixing. And one of the things that has absolutely shocked me about living in Berlin is how spiritual Berlin, the home, the atheist capital of Europe, how spiritual Berlin really, really is. Uh, there's a cover of a 2018 magazine that declared the occult in Berlin is back. Like they were celebrating that. Our family one time stumbled across this gathering in a park of like 200 people in this like new age drumming circle. There's Christian science reading rooms. There's statues of Buddha in store shops all throughout the city. There's, you know, yoga places and like, like really spiritually weird yoga stuff going on. See, secularism doesn't mean the absence of spirituality. That's not what we're heading to here. Secularism means the explosion of spirituality at the expense of Christianity. So when I walk down the streets of Berlin, it's more like Paul walking down the streets of Athens. Oh, you got, a, you got an idol for that God and an idol for that God and an idol for that God? You're highly spiritual people. What I want to suggest to you this morning is that the kind of ministry that advances the kingdom of God presents Christ not only in a form of rational argument, but with deeds matched with power. It's this triumvirate, world, word, deed, power. It's what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 2 when he says, I was with you in weakness and, and in fear and much trembling, but my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might, might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that brings us to the second scene. Look in, in, your, in your Bible to verses 14 through 20. In this second scene, we see the fruit of Christ's ministry in this man's life. Christ's superiority over unseen powers yields fruitful mission because it produces a faith that rests on the power of God. The, the last reason I chose this text this morning is because as a missionary, this passage contains one of the most incredible, beautiful responses to the power and authority of Christ in terms of mission in the entire New Testament. And Christ delivers this man from the demonic, from this deep internal shame, and he immediately commissions him to be on mission. Immediate obedience. I think there's, there's a there's a good chance that this guy went on to have a, a credibly fruitful ministry as a result. I mean, look at verse 14. I'm not going to read this section again. The herdsmen, they, they flee. There's this man totally transformed, changed by the ministry of Christ. I want you pay, to pay attention to the, the complete reversal of the man's condition after meeting Jesus. This is beautiful. I love this. The, 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 the parallels going on. Like before Christ, he's naked, right? 
After meeting Christ, he's clothed. Before he'd been raving and roaming, and now he's calm. Before he'd been screaming, but now he's quiet. Before he'd been alone, but now he's around people. This picture, I love it. This raved lunatic now sitting at the feet of Jesus in the posture of a disciple. From demoniac to disciple. And the people see this and they're afraid. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They care more about their economic loss of property, the ruin of their pig farming economy, than they do the power of Christ to reclaim a man's life. And so they beg Jesus to leave. And so he starts to leave because he only works where he's wanted. But as he's getting in the boat, look at the text. The man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Do you see the contrast? Some beg Jesus to leave. Others beg to be with him. Which one are you this morning? And the Hollywood ending to the story, if I were writing the text, the Hollywood ending to the story is Christ inviting the man into the boat to get a fresh start, a new beginning. That doesn't happen. Verse 19, go home. Tell your friends how much God has done for you. And he goes. He begins to proclaim in the Decapolis. And everyone marveled. And you ever wondered what happened after this? Like Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. By the way, I just dated myself by that illustration. Well, we know that Jesus revisits this region in Mark 7.31. I think he goes to visit the demonized man, the once demonized man, to see how the ministry is going. Uh, some, some people say that the, the feeding of the 5,000 that happens after this is a result of the demoniac's testimony and that the crowd gathered because they saw the transformed life of this man. But what about after that? What about after the Gospels? Well, I, can, I would like to believe, and actually scholars, I'm not alone, scholars think that this man went on to have an incredibly fruitful ministry in the region of the Decapolis. Uh, Eckhard Schnabel uh, pointed out that, uh, that, that because of Galatians 1.17, that we think this man had an incredible ministry. Uh, in Galatians 1.17, Paul is relaying his testimony, this conversion on the road to Damascus, and he shares this little tidbit about going to Arabia after his Damascus Road experience. Well, and the question is, why, why Arabia? Why drop that geographical name in the, the first chapter of Galatians? Well, Schnabel writes that the, the name Arabia, the, the geographic place name Arabia, refers to the, the Nabataean kingdom east of the Jordan River, which was ruled at the time by King Aretas IV and included the cities of the Decapolis. The, the demonized man's hometown area. So what I, what I want to suggest to you possibly is that Paul didn't sequester in Arabia after his Damascus Road experience. He's not hiding somewhere, living as a desert monk, escaping something. He's on mission. Paul is doing at the very beginning what he always does, traveling from church to church to church strengthening the believers. Except here he travels to the region of the Decapolis and strengthens the beginning, the new church that potentially sprung up around the demoniac's testimony. Fruitful mission. And the question needs to be asked here this morning of us. How fruitful is the mission of God here? How fruitful is your mission? Especially in reaching the highly secularized place of Madison. In preparation for this message, I came across a 
2020 study on disciple making in U.S. churches and the study revealed that fewer than 5% of U.S. churches have a reproducing disciple making culture. So there is a good chance that the mission of God struggles here. I mean, how do we get to this place? In the words of Daryl Gruder, the absence of the gospel Jesus preached and the gospel the church has preached has woefully impoverished, impoverished the church's sense of mission. See, Christ came proclaiming the kingdom in power, word, deed, in power, Listen, how is the way of life in Christ possible in advanced modernity, extreme secularism? How? By supernatural power. We are supernatural people. The methodological way we win people to Christ has implications for how the mission unfolds. People in highly secular societies who have cobbled together all kinds of what they think are meaningful expressions of spirituality, they are ripe for syncretism post-conversion if they don't experience the superiority of Christ over every household God. The fruitfulness of the mission depends on it. There's a long, long, long history of Mark 5-like events contributing to Christianity's growth and expansion. It's not just the Gospels or the Book of Acts. It's not just Pentecostalism. Do you know how Christianity started, began in Germany? Do you know the origin story of Christianity in Germany? Began through the ministry of a man by the name of Boniface. Boniface uh, was a grammarian, a poet, a teacher in a Benedictine monastery. And in 722, he was sent to the pagans of Hesse, my namesake, in Germany to begin the mission, and he began the mission then. It's crazy. What unfolded through the event that I'm going to describe for you is, I mean, it's, it's like, it's as dramatic as Elijah's confrontation with the priests of Baal in 1 Kings 18. So Boniface goes to the center of town. You can go to the next slide here. Boniface goes to the center of the town, the town of Geismar, to the sacred oak tree, the oak of Donar, he gathers everybody around. Hey, come on, come. I got something to say to you. He gathers the whole town to the center of the square, pulls out his axe, and begins hacking down their sacred oak tree. I mean, this tree that represented their pagan deity. He cuts their tree down. According to one biographer, as Boniface chops the tree, this wind comes and blows and finishes the job. And when the local god doesn't strike Boniface down, the entire tribe converts to Christianity. And then, as a display of Christ's superiority, Boniface takes the wood from the tree and he builds a church out of it. That's some missionary moxie right there. That's what we need here. But you and I, I think, are under-equipped, ill-equipped to live out this life and be harbingers, bearers of the kingdom. But that's what's needed. In Boniface's case, That encounter led to an incredibly fruitful expansion of Christianity throughout Germany. 
So what does it look like moving forward for us? I mean, it, it, it's, I'm going to end with a, a, little, a little story. It, it's not, you can do this. You've got this. So pre-pandemic, I had been meeting weekly with a German friend of mine to pray for awakening in Berlin, and we'd head out in the harvest and look for people to talk to. Uh, we, as we we're finishing praying, we we're asking God where he wants us to go. God speaks this word of like a bridge, go to a bridge. And they're like, okay, that's weird. I'm thinking in my head, where's, where's the nearest bridge? Pops in my mind, there's a footbridge spanning two neighborhoods about five minutes away. We walk toward that footbridge. It's cold, late spring, uh, early spring, late winter day. We head to the bridge. There's not a lot of foot traffic, but three people standing on the bridge. And I, I, we just know these are the people God has prepared for us to talk to. We approach them. Uh, two of them are from the UK, one's German. We split up. I talk to the guys, in Eng- two UK guys in English. My German friend talks to the third, uh, who's a Berliner in, in German. Turns out these guys are professional graffiti artists. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I mean, they, they, they have no, like, what you and I would think of as a job. They traveled from city to city to city, staying with other graffiti artists. And they were there in Berlin getting ready to tag trains. And, like, it, it was crazy. They, they're, they're talking to me, and they're like, Eric, see that graffiti right there? That's from the guy in Naples. We know him. Oh, see that graffiti? That's, like, that's the distinct artwork from the, from the, the guy we know in Stockholm. Like, they, they knew all the players. And, and these, were, these are hardened guys. Like, the two UK guys that both had been in prison, um, one of them had a, a tattoo of a prison shank on his neck. Like, why you would do that, I don't know. But, and he, he was very happy to tell me the story of why he picked that. Um, the other guy didn't want to be one-upped by his buddy. He's like, oh, that's nothing. He pulled down his shirt. He's got a cross right in the middle of his, like, throat there. He's like, that's not where Jesus is supposed to hang. It's like, that's where the knife goes when someone's trying to kill me. I'm going to help him out. So these are, the, these are the kind of guys I'm talking to. I mean, in terms of secular people, the very definition, they were highly spiritual. We had a great 45-minute conversation about who God is, about the problem of evil. They're asking me deep theological questions. God, Eric, what, is, what does God think about smoking weed? supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> at the end of the 45 minutes, I offered to, to pray for them. And they're like, sure. So this is the application part for us. I'm fully aware when I talk to people like this in Berlin, I've got nothing. It's all him. I laid hands on them, I prayed for them, I blessed them in the name of Christ, and I invited the kingdom to come. It was a simple invitation. It's up to God to do this, not me. By the way, there's no guarantee that this works. I'm like, Jesus healed the ten lepers and nine don't return. Only one returns. This is just fully complementing what we know in Christ. But I prayed for the kingdom to come and we finished praying and they were undone. Like the guy with the shank on his neck was in tears. He's like, what's going on? I feel like God's trying to get my attention. They ignored me for about five minutes and began talking with each other about repenting, giving up their life of graffiti. I'm like, yes, do it. (laughs) I even said things like, if we get caught tonight, we'll know God's trying to get our attention. (laughs) Eventually talked themselves out of it. 
And just like the text this morning, I mean, some beg to be with Jesus and some beg him to leave. But they couldn't deny in that moment that God was real, that he loved them. They knew that. I took leave of them, or as I'm taking leave, they're like, Eric, you want a graffiti with us? Like, I, was, I, was a, I, I took it as a, a real honor. And they pull out their paint pens, and I graffitied the railing on the bridge. I mean, I wasn't the first one to do that. I mean, it was already covered. <laughs> Just in case you're worried about my, my ethics. I drew the symbol. I'm thinking, okay, what image can I draw? I drew the symbol of a Nicthus and explained him. This, 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 is, this symbol means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. I have no idea what happened after that. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Did they get caught? I don't know. We need more of stuff like this here with you guys laying hands on people, praying for healing, maybe? Praying for demonic deliverance, maybe? I I don't know. Maybe it's just praying for the kingdom to come. You guys can do this. I know you can. Father, I thank you for this text this morning. I I just simply ask that you would make us to be more like Christ in every area. Our words, our thoughts, our actions, and our mission. In Christ's name, amen.